Am I audible? Yes. <clears throat> okay, I can share my screen, right? Yes. Okay. 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 So I would like to thank Dr. Ruthul for inviting me to be a part of this very exciting and very different conference. We see a lot of diabetes with pregnancy and we see a lot of GDM and today I'm going to be presenting uh, three cases of IVF with GDM or pre-diabetes. I will not take a lot of your time, don't worry. I think a lot of the things that we have to do has already been covered. Now, when we deal with patients who've undergone IVF and then they develop GDM, it's always very tricky because these are already precious pregnancies, you know, and you want to do everything that you can to protect the pregnancy, to make sure that she undergoes, you know, uh, she delivers the child and has a normal healthy baby. Uh, most of the patients who undergo IVF is, uh, do have risk factors for developing GDM in the future, like PCOS, which is one of the commonest uh, indications for an IVF. So let's look at case one, a 34-year-old woman uh, having undergone IVF uh, conceived. And she visited me at 24 weeks. She had an abnormal OGTT report. Her BMI was 30, blood pressure was normal. She had no history of PCOS, but she had a family history of type 2 diabetes in her father. So this was her OGTT report. Her fasting was 100. Two hours post 75 gram glucose was 180 and her HbA1c was 6. Uh, I'm not going to go into the controversies of, of diagnosis of GDM because I think they've already been dealt with. But this is the most favored uh, guideline where the fasting sugar should be above 126. And if the two are post 75 gram glucose is above uh, or equal to 140, we consider those patients to have gestational diabetes. Now, how will you treat this patient? So I think it's already been highlighted that the first line of management would be lifestyle modification. But even before we move on to medical nutrition therapy, what is very, very important is to give education to the mother. She has to be educated about the implications of GDM. She has to be told that she is going to have to follow a very strict uh, regimen as far as the diet is concerned you know, for a healthy child because it can affect, it can cause mac macrosomia. Uh, it doesn't cause congenital anomalies, thankfully, but it can lead occasionally to stillborns. And what is very important is it can lead to complications at the time of delivery. So the mother has to be explained that she is a high-risk pregnancy. She has to follow up both with the physician and has to be in constant touch with the OB OBGYN. She has to be told the principles of medical nutrition therapy. Uh, I practice in Mumbai, so nutritionists are very easily available to me. But this particular patient completely refused to go to a nutritionist. And as much as I don't want to take charge of that role, uh, I had to play a little bit here because the patient was just not ready. The patient has to be told that she may require to take insulin. Because I remember when I was doing my PG and whenever we used to hear lectures on GDM, we were always told that, you know, most of them don't have an issue. They are ready to take insulin. But uh, we do occasionally come across patients in practice who are not very, very open to the idea of taking insulin even during their pregnancy. The number is small, but it still exists. And we want to, you know, help each and every patient. What is very uh, important is that she should be told that she has to monitor her blood sugars throughout pregnancy. Even if they normalize with MNT, she can't leave monitoring, you know, because as she progresses through the trimesters, the body's insulin requirement increases, the body's insulin resistance increases, and the blood sugars may rise. So she has to monitor blood sugars regularly throughout her pregnancy and the window of opportunity in pregnancy is very small because we only have nine months. Uh, 
The target setting, these are the standard targets that I've taken from Dipsy. Fasting is less, should be less than 95. One hour post meal should be less than 140 and two hours should be less than 120. So generally, I advise most of my patients who are pregnant, have gestational diabetes or pre-existing diabetes to do a seven-point glucose profile, which is fasting, pre-meal, one and a half hour or two hours post meal. Now, I'm just going to share very superficially a few of the principles that I shared with this particular patient. One of the things that works beautifully, which has been mentioned in all of the guidelines, is splitting the breakfast into two. Okay, so if she's having two chapatis and sabji for breakfast, we tell her, okay, have one chapati and a little sabji. And then again, after one and a half hours or two hours, you have another chapati and a sabji. So don't have your whole breakfast in one go. You split it into two. Pregnancy is not the time for obesity correction. We just have to make sure that she doesn't gain any additional weight beyond what she needs to gain. So we expect a 10 to 12 kg uh, weight gain at the end of term. We can, especially in if she has gestational diabetes, give her low GI choices. So what we tell her is that you add protein and fiber in every meal. So if you're having chapati and sabji for breakfast, add a bowl of sprouts with that. Okay. If you're eating only uh, khichdi for dinner, make sure to have a bowl of soup or vegetables with that. So you add protein and fiber in every meal that will lower the GI and help to achieve better control. If you look at the ADA recommendations, they say that only 35% of the total calorie intake should be carbs. So their daily requirement is 175 grams of carbs, 71 grams of protein and 28 grams of fiber. Okay, metformin is a controversy. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, there is a beautiful review article which shows that metformin does have benefit in PCOS and it does help to prevent weight gain during pregnancy. If you look at the guidelines, they're also contradictory. NICE recommends it as a second line and ADA says that it should be, it should be used as little as possible. Okay, so this is the review article and this is the MIG tofu study. So this patient was very compliant to the recommendations. She achieved her targets uh, with medical nutrition therapy and we didn't have to actually uh, go on to any other mode of treatment for her. She had a C-section at nine months and a healthy baby girl with a birth weight of 3.5 kgs. The second case was a 32-year-old who was a known case of PCOS. She was already on metformin and she conceived with IVF. Her first Antenatal visit itself for A1C was 5.7 and it was a twin pregnancy. So at 16 weeks, she again repeated the blood sugars and the fasting was 130, post-lunch 220 and the A1C had shot up to 6.5. So when she had an A1C of 5.7, she had already visited the nutritionist. She was already on medical nutrition therapy. The only thing that was lost or the time that was lost in this patient is because she did not monitor. She was not told the importance of monitoring and we lost time. And by the time she came to me, her sugars were already in a range where I didn't want to think twice. I just started her on insulin. Uh, again, metformin in this patient, because they already lost time, I really didn't want to experiment with the drawing or adding anything. So I continued the metformin. You may stop the metformin if you feel uh, that that would be appropriate in that particular case. So I started her on regular insulin with NPH twice a day. Okay, I gave her her targets. Again, we need a blood sugar chart to decide on the insulin therapy. So we did a seven point blood sugar profile. Uh, she was started with very small doses and we uptitrated the dose every three days till the target which is, was achieved. Uh, after that, I, I had asked her to do a two-weekly follow-up with a lab report and what was explained to her was that every trimester, the insulin requirement goes up. So it is not your failure, it is the requirement of the body and we will have to go up on the insulin every trimester. Unfortunately, this patient was lost to follow post-delivery. She came back to me at three months with type 2 diabetes and we started her on insulin and gradually shifted to OHAs. This is the last case, which is a little different, but very close to my heart. So this is a 40 year old woman who was a known case of type 1 diabetes for 30 years. And she had history of recurrent miscarriages. 
she came to me as soon as her pregnancy was confirmed okay she was asked to take low molecular weight heparin uh, for her uh, uh, st- uh, infertility uh, her last a1c which was done 2 months ago was 9% and we repeated the hba1c at the time and it was 8% so what we did for her is we set the targets which are the same i am not going to go through 95 fasting and uh, well post meal 140 it is very very difficult to achieve in a patient with type 1 diabetes but we tried our best uh, i roped in a nutritionist colleague of mine who worked very very hard on this patient because she had a lot of what if buts and don'ts she had a lot of fasts which she just did not want to give up even though she was pregnant I recommended her to use the CGMS for monitoring. The CGMS targets in pregnancy are a little different, and our aim was that we'll try to bring the HbA1c as close to six as possible. She was an analogs and glargine, and because of the sensitivity of the case, even though glargine is a little controversial, I continued because she was doing well in terms of her fasting sugar. So I didn't want to change something that was working for her because we didn't have a lot of time. you know uh, i really wanted to make sure that diabetes is not the reason for her miscarriages okay so th- this is the cgms target look at this for type 1 diabetes you keep a target range of 63 to 140 and try to achieve 70% there that is what we were trying uh, for this particular patient uh this is just a little bit about the insulins we have an rct on degludec although it's a little bit more costly detamir is the one that is preferred the most during pregnancy after nph but we have a lot of observational studies which have shown that glargine is actually quite safe during pregnancy <laughs> unfortunately in this patient uh she we uh, followed up with her and uh, she actually managed to bring her a1c down to 6.9 but at 10 weeks she had a miscarriage so uh, you know it was very disheartening but at least we know that we did everything that we could in our power to make sure that the cause of the miscarriage was not diabetes because her sugars were actually almost very close to the targets and uh, you know we did the best we could and i wanted to give her that chance thank you i am